folks, this is Chris Wyatt reporting from South Africa. Hey folks, welcome back to Chris White Reports. This is Chris live in central Pennsylvania on Thursday, March 21st, 2024. Benvenu, benvenuti, salve, Ruskot, Ruskot, Hochandit, Utsihilijang, Kwaheri, Abari, Abarengani. Welcome back to the program, folks. Wow, it's crazy. Crazy out there. Lots and lots of news stories today. I scout, let's get a second here. Once again, got the little trouble here, despite some trims. All right. Um, kind of getting stuck over here, this long side. There we go. Uh, did lots of news to talk about today. Scour the globe for a lot of stories to talk about. We're going to cover all over Africa and around the world. Once again, including spots like even New Zealand now, dipping into its second recession. Going to talk about South Africa's illegal land theft, the expropriation of property without compensation, a wholly unnecessary racist effort to divide South African society when this corrupt government of the ANC has had plenty of time to resolve land differences and actually has achieved much of the success necessary to resolve land issues. However, they lie about the story and distort the facts to mislead South Africans and think that the people are in poverty because of land disparity. When in reality, people are in poverty in South Africa because of the ANC's failed macroeconomic policies, its racist legislation, and its pervasive pilfering and theft of government resources. That's why South Africans are in the cock. That's why they live in poverty. That's why they're suffering. And to hear Cyril Ramaphosa give an address today in which he claimed that they are ending apartheid. Listen, genius, apartheid ended, ended before 1994. By 1992, every single piece of racist legislation introduced under the National Party regime was removed under F.W. de Klerk's government. There was no apartheid in 1994. There is a legacy of apartheid and spatial disparities. That is true. However, the ANC inherited that situation with a functioning government, a functioning bureaucracy, a functioning infrastructure, a functioning military, and a functioning capital market, and they've destroyed all of it. The reason that there are tens of millions of more South Africans living in abject poverty today is a direct consequence of the failed policies of the kleptocratic, rapacious, thieving African National Congress. Its incompetence, its patronage, its theft are the reasons why South Africans live in abject poverty, not apartheid. 30 years is more than enough time to overcome those problems, and they have failed to do it. They have failed to do it because they are just liars. And Sir Ramaphosa is one of the biggest ones out there. Minir Palapala telling people about apartheid being responsible and how they change things. They've changed things for South Africa. In 1994, white South Africans could count on functioning infrastructure, safe streets, safe neighborhoods, a functioning capital market, a growing economy, safety, prosperity. Some colored, some Indians, and some black South Africans could count on the same thing. Today, virtually no South Africans are safe in their homes. Virtually no South Africans can drive on roads that actually don't have potholes. Virtually no South Africans have a prospect for prosperity in the future, owing to the African National Congress that has achieved one thing and one thing, two things actually. Two, self-enrichment of themselves and their caters. And number two, the destruction of the most impressive industrial economy on the continent of Africa. These are the two things that the ANC has accomplished in its 30 years of malfeasance. I won't even call it governance anymore. It's malfeasance. Now, if we're honest, and we should be always be honest about the ANC, it got off to a decent start until 2005. Nine years in, things went sideways with the ascendancy of illiterate morons who run the country and their friends, the Guptas and others, and everything went sideways since then. Make no mistake, folks, Manir Palapala is part and parcel of the Zondo Commission era of state corruption and state capture. That's right. Cyril Ramaphosa was the deputy president under Jacob Zuma, and people seem to have forgotten that in their Ramaphoria and talking about how he's a competent, successful businessman. Cyril Ramaphosa is many things, but he's not a competent or successful businessman. That's for darn sure. But Chris, but Chris, he's wealthy. Sure. You hand me equity stakes in companies worth hundreds of millions of dollars with no justification, no sweat equity, no original idea, no earnings whatsoever, only because I'm politically connected. And I guarantee you that after 30 years, I'll be a multi-billionaire, not a multi-millionaire like Cyril Ramaphosa. So let's get on with the story here. Okay, let me say hello to everybody in the chat. Vilma Rasmus was here at the start. George is here. Paulie, the brains behind the operation, George Steinberg. Always thinking of 
the guy who used to run George Steinbrenner, who ran the New York Yankees. Always think about that. Vilma Rasmus, Hest, Hester Kotze, John Hutchins in from Arizona. Peter John Wurst, good evening to you, or good afternoon. And then Arbot is back once again. And then we got G. Sawyer, Eric is here. Alter Bridge, almost put too much chili in your dinner. Well, I'm glad you were able to survive that. Garrett Gillich is in. Dusty, Tony Nash in from the Plains of Alberta. The home of the oil sands. Lorraine Slabbert is here. Gavin Comer. Uh, I've sent you an email, Invaders in a Country. All right, George, I'm not sure what email you sent it to. I assume you sent it to the one for this channel. I'll try to get to that. Ron Post and Accomplice State Capture. Exactly, Lorraine. I don't know if you wrote that before I said it. Um, but yeah, correct. There's Brett Sessoms. Hey, Brett. RJ's back. Ashley Engelbrecht. Welcome, Ashley. Tony Nash. Um, Africa would have increased energy, but they don't want this. Um, it's all a scam. It's all a scam. South Africa is is self-sufficient in coal, bituminous coal, which can be used to burn to generate electricity. However, they choose not to burn it, and they choose also to allow syndicates to sell them rocks and rubble painted as coal um, to defraud ESCOM. And the ANC does nothing about it. They'd rather beg to the West and accuse them of, you know, apartheid energy, you know, the just energy transition. It's all a big scam. Bruce H. is here. Welcome back, Bruce. Little Miss Know It All. Hey, hey, Beverly's back. Hey, Beverly, how you doing? Uh, Beverly, I did see the link you're talking about in that video. I did subsequently find news stories talking about the National Council of Provinces and the bill, and I will talk about expropriation today. I see you're back. And I think there's Sedgefield. I miss Sedgefield. They have covered everybody in the chat. Thanks for joining us, folks. Let's launch right into the news that we have for you today. Your daily dose, your daily jab of no propaganda, no misleading, no dishonesty, but clear, cogent, thoughtful analysis of news and events from around South Africa, around the continent, and around the world. And that's what you get right here. Thanks for tuning in. Let's get to it. Let's get ready to rumble. Well, first off, let's just go with South Africa, where we always start at. The National Council of Provinces has approved six provinces in favor of expropriation without compensation, one opposing it. Of course, that's the Western Cape. Well, let me explain something to you very quickly, folks. Expropriation exists in the South African Constitution of 1995, 96. Yep, it's there. The government can expropriate your property, just like governments in America can use eminent domain to take your property in the public interest. The challenge, of course, is that the thieving ANC doesn't want to compensate the owners for land that they've purchased or they've inherited from loved ones who purchased it, or going far enough back that won it through conquest, which is legitimate means of political discourse. The ANC doesn't want to compensate people. They just want to steal your land. But let me explain why this matters. It's not about taking land from whitey, although a lot of white South Africans think that's what it's about. It's not about taking your farms. This is about, after all, the vast majority of black South Africans who seek land don't seek farms. They don't want to be farmers. They don't want to be like the Zimbabwean scratching out a living in El Nino wipes you out and you starve because you have no real income from no real employment. The subsistence farming, they don't want that. The vast majority of black South Africans just want to own a plot of land for their home that belongs to them. Something the ANC has frustrated and kept them from doing for 30 years because they want black South Africans to be dependent on the state. Hence, State equals the African National Congress. You depend on the ANC. You owe us fealty and loyalty, and you will do as we tell you to, to include voting for us so we can continue to steal the money from the taxpayers, to steal the money and give you a little bit just to keep you placated. That's what it's all about, folks. The expropriation without compensation, as I've warned everybody, now that this is back on the table, we're discussing it again. I was the only analyst to point out from the very beginning, and I noticed all these other analysts, all these other YouTubers, all these brilliant minds in South Africa suddenly started parroting me after I repeatedly told people. And I remember, I have a record. I have an article written on this dating back to 2017 on LinkedIn. It's still there. My article about land and poverty in South Africa in which I talked about this. The reality here is it's about power, political power. Well, let me explain why. We are seeing a perfect example of it right here in the United States. In New York, Letitia James ran for attorney general on one issue, not representing the residents of the state of New York, not applying the laws equally and fairly in New York, not going after gangsters, the mafia, criminal syndicates, drug cartels, pedophiles. She wasn't going after any of that. She ran on a single issue. I will get Donald Trump. Elect me and I will get Donald Trump. Now, the fact that she did that is illegitimate to begin with. Then she runs for office and they bring a lawsuit against Donald Trump for fraud. But he committed no fraud, but he's a political opponent. He dares to speak against the establishment and therefore Letitia James, Alvin Bragg, 
Fonnie Willis, Jack Smith are all weaponized parts of a corrupt judicial system to attack the leading opponent to become the president. And that's the same thing with expropriation without compensation. Because expropriation without compensation applies to property, not to land, but to property. If you own a bucky, if you own a land cruiser, if you own jewelry, if you own stocks and a retirement fund, if you own an apartment somewhere, if you own any property whatsoever that's tangible, the state can expropriate it at any time under this law. And if you think it's only to go after white South Africans, you're very much mistaken. This is an attempt to defraud South Africans. That's what it's all about. When the state has the power to confiscate your property on a whim with no justification whatsoever, you've committed no crime. You've done nothing wrong. They can simply take it. This is a weapon intended to silence opponents of a corrupt regime. That's the purpose of it. And make no mistake, if this becomes the law and the ANC is out of office, the next party in power, whomever that may be, will leave it in place because it's convenient. When their opponents speak ill of them, boom, they confiscate their property and throw them out in the street. This is immoral. This is unnatural. This is criminal. The fact that a law exists does not make it moral, right, or just. Slavery was legal all over the world. That did not make it right, moral, or just. Jim Crow laws existed throughout the United States to prevent black Americans from voting. Not right, moral, or just. Racist legislation exists in South Africa today intended to discriminate against minority South Africans. It's not right, it's not moral, it's not just. But it is lawful. Apartheid was lawful. It was legal under the law. That does not make it right, moral, or just. Expropriation without compensation is a recipe for state collapse. It is a recipe for the abuse of political rights. It is a recipe for the abrogation of natural rights granted by God, not by governments. You should be terrified, ladies and gentlemen, absolutely terrified, whether you're black, you're white, you're brown in South Africa, whether you're Christian, Muslim, or Jew, or you believe in traditional beliefs, or you're a Kosa, a Venda, a Zulu, an Afrikaner, Portuguese, German, Tswana, you should be terrified because the state will take what you have for its word. Arberton is back. Good to see you again. G. Sawyer is here. Grace Irish Zimbabweans who chase white farmers off land and working in South Africa for a better life. A lot of them did. Yep. Do you know that Ramaphosa has gone back to the ICJ a third time with regards to general genocide and Pandora saying that all IDF soldiers are saying so? Uh, yeah, Beverly, I'm aware of that, but I didn't, I, she didn't go, they didn't go to the ICJ about that. They went back to the ICJ about the, the famine that's being caused. So here, let's talk about that. We'll divert from expropriation for just a moment based on what Beverly said. Jabba the Hutt, also known as Not Lady Pandor, the 86th ranked member of the ANC, their 86th important public, uh, politician, yet she has one of the most important portfolios, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Durko, the Director of International Relations and Cooperation. Not Lady Pandor, she only makes it to number 86 on their list of important people. Even the idiot Ronnie LaMola is number five. She's 86. That should tell you all you need to know about Jabba the Hutt. They went back to the ICJ to complain that Israel is causing a famine and the ICJ must intervene. Of course, the ICJ has no enforcement authority whatsoever. It has no army, no police, no weapons whatsoever. It can do nothing. It's all pandering to their friends in Tehran, Moscow, and Beijing. That's what that's all about. Now, the IDF soldiers, they threatened people who fought in the IDF, but they said nothing about South Africans who are fighting in Russia and Ukraine, doing exactly the same sort of thing, exactly the same sort of thing. They threatened South Africans, black, white, and brown, who went to Iraq as contractors, provide security services and kitchen services and all those things. They threatened them with anti-mercenary legislation back during the height of that conflict in the early part of this century. Yet the mercenary law that they crafted at that time made an exception for so-called freedom fighters. So terrorists like MK and the Irish Republican Army, November 17th, the Red Army Faction, Hezbollah, Hamas, would not be prosecuted for engaging in foreign conflicts. However, those who served in uniform for a foreign nation or those who pay, were paid as a contractor for foreign nations would be prosecuted because it didn't suit the narrative of the leftist, criminal, terror-loving ANC. Yep, yep. Yep. 
bogus lawsuit against Trump and desperation Democrats is maintained here. Yes, it is. It's so true. Imagine the power of Trump convincing the banks to give loans based on his own valuation estimates. Why, why nobody, why nobody at the bank were charged for fraud? I'll wait. Exactly, G. Shore. Let me just run through the Trump thing very quickly since we have an audience of 112. This is the thing with Donald Trump. So Donald Trump, the Trump organization, was approached. See, Letitia James lied. This is not carried in the story. Now, first, number one, Judge Dingbat Erdogan declared that Trump was guilty before he held a trial. Before hearing evidence, before hearing a defense in the trial, he publicly declared that Trump committed fraud. He should have been removed from the bench for that alone. That makes this on appeal. This thing should be thrown out based on that. Prejudgment of guilt before trial. Public record is no secret. That's a statement of fact. Number one. Number two, he constantly prevented Trump from defending himself at the trial or his attorneys from defending him, interrupt, failing to allow them to introduce evidence. Then when Letitia James brought Deutsche Bank into the conversation and talked to Deutsche Bank executives, she lied and she should be disbarred for lying. She lied falsely claiming that Deutsche Bank was catered. Deutsche Bank was wooed by the Trump organization. And that all fell apart, but it didn't matter because it's a show trial. It all fell apart when the senior executive from Deutsche Bank got on the stand and said, when questioned directly, under oath, under threat of perjury, that Deutsche Bank official, when Letitia James' attorneys asked, the Trump administration wooed Deutsche Bank, yes? And, the, and, the, and she said, no, no, not at all. My bosses at Deutsche Bank told me to woo the Trump organization. We wanted Trump's business. That was a big name. Deutsche Bank wanted to loan him money. So we invited them to dinner. We took them to places. We wooed the Trump organization so they would come to Deutsche Bank instead of UBS or some other bank. So that all falls apart. That's a lie. Next thing is, Trump offered a portfolio of his businesses as collateral that the bank could repossess should he fail to pay back the loan. So number one, the bank has to make a decision. They do their own due diligence. Banks do that. They do that when you borrow money for a car. That's why you get lower interest rates if you have good credit. You get higher interest rates if you don't have such good credit and you don't get a loan if you have bad credit. The bank looked at the value of the assets. They didn't agree with Trump's assessment, the Trump organization's assessment of how much they're worth. They negotiated back and forth and they said, okay, we'll agree these assets are worth this much. Based on that collateral, we will loan you this much money, which the Trump organization did. Now, the purpose of a judgment in a trial is punishment, but more importantly, in a trial like this, a fraud trial, it's to compensate the victims. Who are the victims here? New Yorkers who got what? How were they cheated? Deutsche Bank? Every payment was made on time with interest and the loan is gone. Who was harmed by that loan from Deutsche Bank? The only plausible argument one can make is, well, the Trump organization cheated and someone else could have got that money. But Deutsche Bank did not preclude loans to anyone else based on the money they loaned to the, to the Trump organization. It's total bogus nonsense. And then the judgment, $453 million. To whom? The state of New York? There are no victims to compensate for their loss. Deutsche Bank made money on the loan to the Trump organization. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the way the real estate market works. This is the way developers build. They borrow vast sums of money based on their history, their ability to pay back the loans, and their portfolio of underlying assets. If this is fraud, the entire construction industry is doomed to failure the world over. RJ says, before advocating a law, consider if they would have your enemy have that. Exactly right. I would never, ever advocate for expropriation without compensation. I'm not a fan of eminent domain. Please don't demean job like that. <laughs> yeah. Who gets to decide who receives property? My concern is it sends the gamble criminal individuals to take property. Um, I don't think that's the problem. Uh, Christopher, though, I appreciate your thoughts on that. No, uh, it's the favored class. That's who decides. That's the problem with this law. Corrupt officials who have no legitimacy will decide the fate of your property. How come this uh, this farce continues? Where is the legal system in America? Well, the legal system in America is broken in many places, uh, many, many places. And it's a consequence of decades of lawfare by Democrats and leftists to undermine the courts. And it starts as early as Roe versus Wade. That's when everything went sideways. I mean, look, no system is perfect. Let's give you an example. So in 1856, was it? I think 1856, we had the Dred Scott decision, or 1857, the Dred Scott decision. Dred Scott was a... a 
former slave or was he a free man that was, I think it might've been a free man, that was, um, was captured by slave traders um, looking for runaway slaves when he was in a Northern state. He was taken back to Virginia or somewhere like that. I don't remember exact details, so don't call me on that. It's been a while since I looked up the Dred Scott case, but I know the outcome of it. This case went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court, um, the Supreme Court determined, more spam calls, Supreme Court determined that uh, under the law, slavery was legal, which it was, and that he was a slave and therefore he had no rights and therefore he was returned to slavery. Dred Scott. Now that's immoral, but it was not illegal. So let's jump forward 1898, Plessy versus Ferguson related to a streetcar in Louisiana in which a gentleman was um, told to get off the streetcar. In that, the doctrine of separate but equal, something later came under apartheid, you know, separate development, separate but equal was said to be legal under the constitution by the Supreme Court. Now they got it wrong. They absolutely got it wrong. Separate but equal is an abomination of the constitution. The Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment means that all American citizens, American citizens, not foreign nationals, American citizens are guaranteed equal protection under the law, under the 14th Amendment. Plessy versus Ferguson, was an abomination that undermined equal protection under the law. From 1898 until 1954, when Brown versus the Board of Education came into play, Supreme Court correctly determined that school children could not be denied access to a school based on their skin color, regardless of whether there were equal and appropriate facilities for that group. So that ended it. And the Democrats in the South prevented black students from going to schools by putting up barriers, threatening them chase them out of schools. However, the Eisenhower administration, Republican, sent U.S. Army troops to Arkansas to ensure that little school children who were black could go to school. So courts get it wrong. Courts get it wrong. And they get it right sometimes. There's always only a plan to take property but never give. That's how they, yeah, exactly. Keep taking from people instead of rewarding those who, rewarding those who contribute to the economy. Uh, eminent domain has been used throughout the last hundred years to destroy the black communities, force takeover property, building highways. Yeah, okay, menage a It's also been used to destroy the property of many white Americans, many, many white Americans who lost our homes. Bridgeport, Connecticut was not a black neighborhood. It was white Americans whose families had owned houses there for over a century who were illegitimately defrauded of their land so that the state could build a casino resort in Bridgeport, Connecticut. That's a fact. That's a fact. So yes, what you state is true, but let's not just that the Americans have been defrauded by eminent domain. At the same time, eminent domain has been a useful tool for governments to ensure the efficient development of rail systems and ports in America. That's a statement of fact too. It's a very dangerous thing for the state to be able to take what you own, but we have to respect property rights. Alex Stockel's here. Wait, hey Alex, wow, man, long time, man. Long time. Uh, Beverly says, so we'll go after all the upper class, especially in Cape Town. The big danger is we're going to end up in a civil war. Yeah, there's a danger of that. Biden says something about schools becoming racial jungle. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. I need to oppose uh, propaganda 24. What? Marcus used is dead? No way. Let's look at that. News 24. That is breaking news. If that's true, that's not what, what is this? It's... Wow. That's, that's something else. What is this? Wow. Wow, folks. Okay, this is what they're reporting. Let's let's go to that. Thank you for telling me that just came out. Uh, I got to get all the way back here. We haven't even gotten very far. So, so this is breaking news from News Twenty Four, claiming that Marcus used to the former head of Steinhoff is dead. Details are uncertain. An incident. It says an incident. So was he shot, assassinated, committed suicide? What happened here? News comes a day after the financial sector conduct authority fined him for $475 million after it found he and Steinhoff's former European finance chief, Dirk Schreiber, were responsible for publishing deceptive statements about Steinhoff's international financial position for four years. He resigned from Steinhoff at the end of 2017, triggering a near collapse of the wiped out $200 billion in pension fund money and other investments as investors realized the financial statements were manipulated. Wow, Eusta. Wow, let's go ahead and take a look at that. That's crazy. Marcus used to see if he's turning up anywhere else in the news real quick now, not just News 24. Let's see if he turns up anywhere. This should be a trending thing. Uh, nope, they're the only ones reporting it at the moment. 
Yep, no one else is reporting. Wow, that is huge news, folks. You heard it here. Thank you, Paulie. Breaking news, the former CEO of Steinhoff International, Marcus Eusta, reportedly died in an incident, an incident, whatever the incident is, in South Africa, presumably. Uh, just hit with a 475 million rand judgment yesterday. Marcus Eusta, former Steinhoff CEO, reportedly dead today, the 21st of March, 2024. Quite a frightening situation there. Let's see what happens on that. Well, ladies and gentlemen, South Africa's actions, the ANC's actions in attacking U.S. foreign policy, undermining U.S. foreign policy, undermining the United States position in the world is coming to a head. The chickens are coming home to roost. Now, probably nothing will happen until Trump comes back in office. But in the meantime, South Africa has jeopardized its position. My representative, Scott Perry from Pennsylvania, proposed ending all assistance to South Africa. That was defeated. That measure was defeated because people were whining about PEPFAR and saying it would have a disastrous impact. But quite frankly, the president's emergency program for AIDS relief was meant to be a three to five year program. Here we are two decades plus later, still paying the cost of Africans and the consequences of their behavior. Why are we still paying for PEPFAR? Why isn't South Africa paying for its HIV-related cost? Why are we paying for it? South Africa can, cannot be rehearsing drills to kill U.S. soldiers and still expect to be funded, the House hears. There is Michigan Republican Representative John James after a House Republican conference election. That's back in November. So that's what that was. But what is John James talking about? What, what are South Africans rehearsing to kill Americans? Well, their Navy exercises with China and Russia off the coast of South Africa. Wow. So finally, somebody in the U.S. government is paying attention to the transgressions of the ANC. South Africa is pushing buttons that they shouldn't push. Foreign Affairs Committee of the U.S. Congress lower house was debating House Resolution 7256, a bill that would force the Biden regime to do a full review of the bilateral relationship between the United States and South Africa. The law cites South Africa's relationships with Russia, China, and Iran, and it stands on the Hamas terror attack on Israel, or contrary to American interest. Its sponsor, John James, suggested the evidence is clear. Well, I've been reporting the evidence for years. Thank you for finally somebody noticing. Maybe rehearsing drills to kill American soldiers and sailors is not necessarily a position of non-alignment, but a position of provocative aggression is what James says. And indeed it is. Why should we give South Africa $660 million when they piss down our throat? They piss in our eyes and tell us the sun is shining. Or piss in our face and say it's raining. Of course, I'm talking about the ANC. Yep, he was referring to the Russian-Chinese naval exercise with one South African ship. If this passes, the presidency would have 30 days to release an unclassified determination explicitly stating whether South Africa is engaged in activities that undermine U.S. national security or foreign policy interests. If it's found that South Africa is undermined, U.S. would likely end South African eligibility under the African Growth and Opportunity Act, which they abrogated in 2018. I've been arguing for this for six years. South Africa has no business in a go. They are malignant actors, ANC. They have violated and abrogated property rights Yep, and they have racist legislation. Yep. As the legislation itself, James focuses criticism not on the government of South Africa, but on the ANC. And that's the right move. Don't blame South Africans, blame the ANC. It's clear that the ANC of today is no longer the party of Nelson Mandela. <laughs> yeah, duh, you think? Wow. The ANC of today is putting its party above its people and the institutions of the Republic of South Africa. James argued that South Africa has a sovereign right to its own policies, but that its choices have consequences and that the American people also have a choice in how they spend their tax dollars. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Pennsylvania's Republican Scott Perry wanted to place such a more, more total moratorium on all of it. James argued against a proposed amendment to the draft law, which would put a one-year moratorium on at least 5.25 billion rand in U.S. funding. Scott Perry wanted to put that moratorium in place on everything, including USAID, until South Africa had been cleared of collusion with America's enemies. Why must we continue to send money to a country that clearly hates our allies and consorts with our enemies, said Scott Perry. More simply put, why do we have to pay our enemies when they can hate us for free? Thank you, Scott Perry. Yep. James countered the proposal would also cut off funding for PEPFAR. And? And? South Africa's had two and a half decades to come up with a funding source to take care of this. Nick Groves just gave a super chat. 
Thank you. Do you think ANC are trying to burn South Idea, knowing the possible possible ousting of them in the coalition? Yeah, no, I think that the ANC is doing two things. Number one, they're simply answering to their paymasters, their fellow travelers in Tehran, Beijing, and in Moscow. That's just who they are. That is their DNA. That is who they are. They can't help themselves. They can't help themselves. Watch my video, which hardly anybody's watched, not even a thousand people watched, the video I did last night about how the ANC today, who criticized Chester Crocker and the Reagan administration for their policy of constructive engagement in engaging with apartheid era national party in South Africa in 1981, when they're doing exactly the same thing vis-a-vis -vis Iran and Russia in 2024. 44 years later, now, Lady Pondor is channeling her inner Chester Crocker. Hum, 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 Chester Crocker. She is channeling her inner Chester Crocker. That's what Lady Pondor is doing. And the ANC is engaging in constructive engagement, the exact same policy that Chester Crocker and Reagan did in 1981, and they were criticized roundly for it. Make no mistake, the Carter administration's actions to stop South Africa had no impact. The Reagan administration's policies had some impact, but the reason apartheid ended was not because of the ANC. It was not because of black consciousness and Steve Biko. It was not because of the black sash movement. It was not because of international sanctions. The reason that apartheid ended is because the Cold War ended. The raison d'etre, the reason for being for the apartheid state disappeared. This apartheid state had open or tacit support from the West so long as there was a threat of communism expanding in Africa. And it was in Angola, Mozambique, Tanzania. The threat kept coming. The frontline states. And as long as South Africa's government was a bulwark against communism, they had friends in the West. When communism ended, there was no justification for supporting them. And to their credit, senior leaders of the National Party saw the end before many people in the West saw it coming. And as early as 1987, Peak Bota was meeting, or P.W. Bota was meeting with Nelson Mandela in private. But Mandela was unbending and unwilling to make concessions at that time. Only after De Klerk became the prime minister did things change. Yep. Funny thing here is that the ANC are continually claim there's no money for infrastructure and want a private sector to give billions, but there's always money for parties and intel trips. Yeah. Well, and trips to the ICJ. Yep, 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 yep. Yep. Andre says, no one has ever heard of the Sullivan Code, the U.S. intervention to help the ANC and others through disinvestment in the 1980s. Uh, not no one, Andre. I've talked about what's happened here. We've talked about the former mayor of, of, of Atlanta. We've talked about the black congressional leaders and the effort for divestment that led to virtually every American company abandoning its investments in South Africa, including Ford and IBM and everyone else. Yep. That's right, Ken, the truth that nobody acknowledges. Everything I say here is the truth. Yep. Uh, Garrett is saying it's the same as Gavin Watson and Brett Kebble. You know, um, without any more information, Garrett, that'd be my first thought. The same thing that happened to Brett Kevill and Gavin Watson, no doubt about it. As long as Streetwise and Free Shirt will be involved, the diehard ain't supporters will support them at their own peril, says Gavin. I see a pattern, yes. Yep. Great short that is on Chester Crocker, yep. Yeah, I know, Chester Crocker and constructive engagement. That is exactly, ladies and gentlemen, that is exactly what the United States government pro chose as its foreign policy in the 1980s vis-a-vis -vis the apartheid National Party. The ANC is taking the exact same approach with Russia and Iran today, attacking Israel, who are defending themselves from a terror attack. Make no mistake, ladies and gentlemen, this is factual information. You simply need to pay attention to events. On October 7th, 2023, with no provocation whatsoever, with no justification whatsoever, with no breakdown of diplomatic relations, with no threat from Jerusalem. Hamas, the elected government in the Gaza Strip. Hamas crossed the border, invaded Israel, raped, tortured, dismembered, disfigured, and murdered 1,200 people. And they weren't all Jews. There were Muslims, Christians, and Buddhists involved as well, but mostly Jews. A terror attack, an invasion of Israel. Israel was invaded. 
When Russia was invaded by the Nazis in 1941, nobody said Russia can't invade, the Soviet Union can't defend itself. When France was invaded in 1940, no one said France can't defend itself. When Poland was invaded in 1939, no one said Poland can't defend itself. Israel was invaded by a hostile force whose sole purpose is to exterminate the Jewish state, whose sole purpose is to exterminate Jews expressly in their constitution. Yet the United States today is announcing a demand for an immediate ceasefire, which is a pause to refit and rearm for Hamas to kill more Israelis. Nancy wants billions of dollars while standing in the corners with his enemies. Yep. Nancy's money problems are turned, in my opinion, because the funder paid for different ICD outcome, which wasn't delivered. Might be true. Percentage of Muslims are only 1.6 total population. Don't worry about it. No, they're less than 1%. Right? That's, that's, not a, that's a pretty close estimate, Andre. Um, no, it was a disaster. I did not see that, Ken. Gabriel says, well, they're also criticizing Europe, but they have forgotten that the Europeans were part of the harsh sanctions that brought South Africa to its knees, so give in for the release of my nail. True, they were. Um, because there's no money for engineering boards. Okay, let's get back to the news. Okay, so uh, the, the, the United States is coming for South Africa, but I'll tell you what, it's not going to go anywhere while Joe Biden is president. Trump comes back in office and the Republicans control the House and Senate. South Africa's relations with the U.S. are dead, are dead, ladies and gentlemen. I will tell you that right now. Every single interaction with South Africa will be suspended at least for 12 months with the exception of PEPFAR, should Donald Trump become president again and Republicans take the House and Senate. So no wonder not Lady Pondora's in the States trying to hoodwink Americans into believing something that's not true. The Daily Maverick reporting a bill that calls for full review of U.S. relations with South Africa crosses the first hurdle in Congress that got out of committee. Peter Fabricius, who writes very well for the Daily Maverick, said the act is expected to pass a formal roll call in committee on Wednesday and move on to the full House of Representatives. That was yesterday. Yep. But it's a bill. Biden has to sign into law, which he will never do. Well, Cyril Ramaphosa is boasting that, hey, 250 billion rand for black firms. Why do we call firms black firms? Why are South Africans obsessed with black and white? More than 70 South Africa's biggest companies, including ShopRite, Absin, Naspers, VW, South Africa, Ford, and Sappy, the paper company, have pledged to spend more than a quarter of a trillion rand on procurement from black industrial companies over the next five years. Why? Why are you committed to that? What is that all about? How much money have you committed to Indian and colored and white enterprises? Well, South Africa can kiss goodbye 235 more of the failed, bankrupt South African Postal Service, which once functioned under the National Party. South African Post Office, or SAPO, says that 235 more post offices are set to close this year, with more retrenchments coming. Yep, this is from a question and answer session in Parliament. In the Free State Northwest, 104 will close, 41 in Hauteng, Limpopo, Mpumalanga, Northwest. Western Region 28, which is Western Cape, Northern Cape, Eastern Cape 24, KZN 21, and in Hauteng and the Val Triangle 17. For 235 additional post offices will close. Why? Because they're bankrupt and they have no money because the ANC has destroyed them. To be fair, the snail mail system is suffering the world over. It's not simply ANC incompetence, but also the 21st century, which are crushing them. Well, Ramaphosa says that the apartheid government passed nothing but generational poverty South Africans as he commemorates Human Rights Day, the anniversary of the Sharpeville Massacre in 1960. 60, right? Uh, 61, 1960. Pretty sure that's when it was. Anyway, March 21st, 1960. The Sharpeville Massacre, which is really when things began to turn in South Africa. It took some time. But he says the apartheid government passed nothing but generational poverty to South Africans. I'm sorry. So you didn't inherit a functioning stock market, functioning ports, functioning airfields, profitable airline, despite the fact they couldn't land anywhere or fly anywhere over Africa. You didn't inherit um, the rip and trope process for taking coal and turning it into fuels. Didn't inherit that. You didn't inherit a functioning nuclear power plant. You didn't inherit a functioning bureaucracy. You didn't inherit schools that worked. Of course, there were many that need to be built. You didn't inherit infrastructure. You didn't inherit wealth. You didn't inherit a gold reserve. So nothing, nothing was passed down but generational poverty. Well, one can very much make the argument that that's simply a lie. And of course, it is a lie. So Ramaphosa is a perpetual liar. So from Statistics South Africa's own website, 
30 years of ANC governance. This is from their own website. This is from 2014, 2015, and it's worse now. Approximately half, 49.2% of adult population were living below the upper bound poverty line. So half of South Africans, adults, not kids, adults, were living in poverty in 2014, 2015. That number is well over 50%. Now it's 60%. According to the state data from 2014, 2015, there were 35.1 million adults then, 10 years ago, aged 18 and older. And that resulted in almost 50% poverty. In abject poverty, one in five South Africans today lives in abject poverty. And you can blame all of this, not on Jan van Riebeck, not on Hendrik Ververt, but on the African National Congress, whose racist and wrong-headed policies have destroyed South Africa, not to mention its kleptocracy and its incompetence in hiring people based on their skin pigmentation, not on their capacity for production. Gauteng and Western Cape had the lowest proportion of adults living in poverty. However, in 2015, 67 of adults in Limpopo were in poverty. In the Eastern Cape, it was 67.3. In KZN, it was 60.7. And in Northwest Province, it was 59.6. Wow. Gauteng and the Western Cape, it was 29 and 33%. That's just crazy. That's just crazy. And the lies. So the ANC, in his policy, he talks about how the ANC has changed things for the better until 2005, but since then, it's all been backwards. It's all been backwards. Sir Ramaphosa is a serial liar. Anybody that believes him is a fool. Ramaphosa said the apartheid government passed nothing but generational poverty to South Africans. Many South Africans were subjected to poverty as a result of the apartheid system of colonialism that deliberately dispossessed and took their assets that would have been passed to various generations and families. I'm sorry. Which families under apartheid were writing apps for the internet? Who under apartheid had their PayPal system stolen from them or their computers or their entrepreneurial businesses? Please tell us, Cyril. All of these things have come about since the end of apartheid. We didn't have the internet for the public in 1994. It came around in, well, it came around in 94 when you took over. But you took over in April and it wasn't until the fall that Mark Anderson and the University of Illinois at Carbondale released Mosaic in 1994. And the internet took off in 95. So how were people dispossessed of things that did not exist back then? He delivered a keynote address at the national commemoration of the events in Sharpville in Gauteng. During his address, he said the Democratic government uh, was doing everything in its power to dismantle the apartheid government system. Excuse me. Cyril Ramaphosa is a sack of horse manure. He is a sack of cock. Remember that? Hashtag sack of cock. We had that on this program years ago. Cyril Ramaphosa is a total fraudulent liar. He is not dismantling apartheid. Declare dismantled apartheid. It's been gone since 1992. Every single racist law that the National Party put in place was gone from South African society by 1992. Every single one. No, the Brits did not start apartheid, Beverly. That's not true. It's not true. Apartheid is a system of separate development begun after 1948 when the National Party came into power under Hendrik Ververt. Now, there were laws that were racist laws, but that wasn't apartheid. The Native Lands Act of 1913 wasn't apartheid. It was meant to reserve land for one group of people over the others. And also, it didn't reserve only 13% for blacks. That's a lie. There were subsequent laws that led to just 13% of the land being available for blacks, but not the Native Lands Act. People tell history in a false fashion. But back to the story. So, the ANC government is not dismantling apartheid. Here's a news flash for the born frees. You were all born in a system where there was no apartheid. Anybody born after 1992, which is the majority of South Africa's population, grew up in a society which had no national party apartheid separate development laws. They were gone. They were gone. Now, he's going to argue that, that the legacy exists. Well, the legacy of your lies exists. The legacy of the necklacing and the murder of 20,000 Inkata party members in KZN in the early 1990s, that legacy still exists too. And it devastated the talent and human capital of Inkata to this very day, all because of the ANC. He said the government had returned nearly 4 million hectares of land to people who had been dispossessed of the land and acquired over 4 million hectares of land for redistribution. That's factually incorrect too. 
that's factually incorrect too. It wasn't 4 million hectares of land that was from people who were dispossessed. Most people who were dispossessed of land took financial settlements. Only a handful of people, a few hundred people, actually took land back. And those people didn't get 4 million hectares of land. What the ANC has done is they've bought land on a willing buyer sell and a willing seller basis and people aspiring to own land who happen to be black can get land and some colors under this program. They weren't people dispossessed of land. These are just broad-based stereotypical lies that are typical of politicians. And in this case, that's what they are. Very few people who have their land taken from them forcefully under the apartheid legal system actually went back to the land that they were on prior to that. District 6 in Cape Town is a perfect example. of It sits lying fallow to this day, much of District 6. Perfect example. Cyril Ramaphosa lies, and you know, because his lips are moving. We've provided social grants for children, the elderly, and people with disability, and recently introduced a special social relief and distress grant for unemployed people. And you're proud of that? You're proud of 40 million South Africans living in poverty? Who is proud of pushing people into poverty? Hey, listen, listen, you know, look, um, our policies discriminate against the minority South Africans who are the engine of growth in this economy. We discriminate against uh, everyone who's not a cater. And we've pushed another 20 million people into poverty in South Africa. But hey, it's okay because we've saved them with social grants. Wow. The government provides free daily meals to millions of school children and expanded the number of fee-free schools and has massively increased funding for students from poor and working class families to attend universities and colleges. Yeah, students who aren't qualified to go to universities and colleges then you wasted taxpayer money. And providing free meals? How about providing a system that ensures a level playing field for everybody so that everybody has a fair chance to succeed in education, in society, in starting and running a business instead of skewing the outcomes to ensure poverty so you can look like heroes by giving away things that other people pay for. In addition, the economy has improved. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, that's simply a lie too. The economy has not improved. South Africa's economy is in the crapper. Absolutely the case. Absolutely the case. So here we go. This is from Trend Economics. This is South Africa's GDP. GDP. You ready for this? Let's get this up here. This is under the ANC since 2012 when it reached a peak. South Africa's economy reached its peak in 2012. But this is owing to the policies or the system inherited by the ANC and then the policies under Mandela and Becky up that led them. Now, Becky left before 2012, but the positive benefits of this led to growth until state capture and corruption of the ANC set in and they saw the golden calf and they went to steal it. This is what South Africa's GDP looks like, folks, in the last decade, 15 years, last 15 years. So in 2012, it was $438 billion. And look how it dropped to... 323 billion from 2012, 13, 14, 15 to 16. There was no global financial crisis. It was over by 2012. And this is what happened to South Africa's economy. It contracted for five consecutive years. Then it bounced back briefly because of commodity prices. Then it dropped again in 2020 because of Rona. And today, South Africa's economy is smaller than it was in 2012. At just $405 billion, according to World Bank data. That is $33 billion less than it was in 2012, before we even consider all the years of lost growth. South Africa's economy needs to grow, ladies and gentlemen, by 6.5 to 8% per year, year after year for 10 to 15 years to even begin to catch up with a deficit created by the ANC's lethargic GDP growth. That has not happened. The economy today is lower than it was in 2012. 2012, 14 years ago, South Africa had a larger economy than it does today. It also had a much smaller population 14 years ago. So what does that mean? If 438 billion was the economy in 2012 with a population of roughly 48 million people, that means the per capita income was much higger and inflation was much lower. So you ran, bought much more. Today, the economy is $35 billion less for 15 million more people. But the ANC has grown the economy. Liar, liar, Cyril's pants are on fire. Good Lord. What a bunch of nonsense. What a total crock. What a total crock. He says, despite the unemployment rate being high, the number of South Africans' employment is more than double in 30 years. 
Well, duh, the number of population has gone from 34 million in 1994 to 63 million in 2024. Good Lord, these people think we're stupid because they're stupid. Unbelievable. Well, South Africa has much to celebrate since 1994, according to Cyril Ramaphosa. And there's five, um, so LMI5 Pence got a membership. Congratulations. Uh, and that's all courtesy of Nick Groves. Uh, Nick yeah, gave that. We got more. Tony Nays, John Hoochin, Christopher Arbitrin. Yeah, and Hester. So there is John Hoochin in Arizona, membership. So much to cheer about since 1994, says Cyril Just lies. Total lies. Tony Nash. Yeah, so Cyril says that um, the country commemorates Human Rights Day, that there's much to be celebrating. Yeah, well, there was much to be celebrated in 2005, but not 20 years later. Charles Van Onselen. The national event coincides with 30th anniversary of the country's attainment of freedom and democracy. Not really. It was in April of 1994, not March. But anyway, 64 years have passed since the ground on which we gather here in Sharpville. Christopher Arbitrary. Since the ground here in Sharpville bore witness to one of the worst atrocities committed by the apartheid regime against the South African people. Though many decades have passed, we still remember with great sorrow and pain the 69 people were killed. And Hester Kotza. Thank you for that. The, um, the 69 people were killed and many more who were maimed as they protested in peace against the grave injustice imposed upon them. Mark Sayers. Yeah, unbelievable, folks. Unbelievable. So Ramaphosa is trying to channel his inner Sharpville. He doesn't know anything about Sharpville. Well, residents of Freiburg, Alan Fredericks, residents of Freiburg still trying to get water. Years later, ladies and gentlemen, years later, amid tensions over what Freiburg residents have described as a man-made crisis has left thousands of people without water for months. Might be. Yep. Toboho Lebona is a community activist born and raised in Freiburg, and he's been hit by heart crisis his last more than a decade. There's no water. Myra? Yep. So, until the municipality gets their house in order, people are not happy in Freiburg, not getting water. Well, this is just plain silly, okay? So, the water crisis in South Africa is being blamed on apartheid. Can politicians ever accept responsibility for the failures of their own? Nobody was suffering from not getting this water back in the day. But this is what Rise and Zanzi has to say. Songizu Zibi, apartheid isn't over while the water crisis continues. And what's that? That's oh, a super chat from George Steinberg. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. Thank you for that. So let's get back to this very quickly here. So. This week, to commemorate Human Rights Day on the anniversary of the Sharpeville Massacre, um, grandchildren wade through raw sewage daily in what Human Rights Commission has found to be an obvious violation of their rights to dignity. According to the government's latest Green Drop report, 64% of South Africa's wastewater treatment works are at high or critical risk of discharging raw sewage into our rivers. Now, what does that have to do with apartheid? There were communities that had no sewage. That's apartheid. Those are separate development policies. But... The uh, the National Party left functioning sewage systems in place when it left office. And the ANC built new ones. There's Paulie. 100 Rand. Nothing but facts this evening. You're welcome. Um, this functional council of M. Fulani, which includes Sharpville, is particularly hard in bad shape. At least one of its treatment plants has been designated high risk. M. Fulani carries a particular burden. Its, renew its sewage directly enters the river that runs along it, the Val, which provides 19 million South Africans of the water. Ooh. Poo water again. Well, cholera will be coming out of that. Just wait on it. Cholera will be coming out of that. But, of course, um, ZB, who's the leader and founder of Rise and Zanzi, uh, basically wants to evoke apartheid to explain the ANC's failures. No, no. The ANC's failures are their own. So the question remains, ladies and gentlemen, who paid the 28.9 million rand for Paul Machatile's luxury home in Cape Town? Who paid for that, folks? We still don't know. There you go. The seven-bedroom, 28.9 million Constantia Cape Town house purchased by Deputy President Paul Machatile's son-in-law in Quebe in Nonquelo in 2023. A Hawks investigation is following the cash used to buy the luxury uh, mansion. And uh, that guy's been married to his pre the president, Deputy President's daughter, Palesa, since 2006. Hmm. 
The Director for Priority Crime Investigation of the Hawks has confirmed that it's early stages of investigating the source of funds used to pay for that. It's stressful if I could believe the lies the same as they do, says RJ. Yeah, no. Hester has to go. All right. Um, thanks for being here. Be sure to hit the like button before you go. How is the water situation in Halteng? It's precarious. Precarious. Everything south of that gets blamed on apartheid and Jan van Riebeck. Yeah, that's true. Yep. Well, Ramaphosa, Sil Ramaphosa, congratulates Vladimir Putin on his improbable 87% victory in a record turnout of 77% of the Russian population to once again elect Vladimir Putin as the president. Well, congratulations, according to Cyril, fellow traveler. President Ramaphosa congratulated Russian President Vladimir Putin on his victory in the country's most recent presidential election. Russian citizens headed the polls and they cast 87.8% for him to his fifth term as president. Ralph Post said the country remains committed to mutual cooperation with the rogue Russian state, including the two countries' common membership in the UN, BRICS, a non-existent organization, just an idea, and the G20. <laughs> South Africa is not a G20 member. <laughs> well, turn your attention from South Africa to neighboring Namibia. Hey, folks, sandboarding is making a comeback. That's right. Reuters reports that sandboarding is making a comeback because cruise ships are docking in Wolfish Bay. That's right. That's right. And so they're all making their way up to the dunes in Swakopmund. Set against miles of mesmerizing sand dunes in the Namibia seaside resort of Swakopmund is seeing a boon in sandboarding. Boy, by near doubling of the number of cruise liners docking at nearby Wolfish Bay last year, lying between 80,000 square miles of Namib desert and sea, Swakopmund is drawing tourists back three years after the lockdown brought the number of visitors to a standstill. Hmm. It had been a million a year, but now it's picking up again as people slide down the dunes. Anyone ever done that? Anyone ever gone? I skipped it and I regret it. I wanted to go quad bike riding on those dunes. That's pretty cool, but I skipped it and I've never done it. Well, another story in Namibia where an answer potentially to the mysterious fairy circles has been discovered by scientists. According to scientists, this report in physics.org says the fairy circles are a consequence of water stress and new grass can't form in the center. I don't know that I'm sold on this, but these are famous fairy circles. That one's near Kambag. Namibia's legendary fairy circles are mysterious circular bulb patches in the dry grasslands on the edge of the Namib desert. Their formation has been researched for decades and has recently been the subject of much debate. With extensive field work, researchers from the University of Göttingen in Germany and Ben Gurion University in Israel investigated how freshly germinated grass dies inside the fairy circle. Results show the grass withers due to lack of water inside the fairy circle. The topsoil, comprised of the top 10 to 12 centimeters, acts as a kind of death zone in which fresh grass cannot survive for long. The new grass dies between 10 and 20 days after the rain, according to researchers, because the roots can't get down in the soil far enough, and so only the established stuff can survive. The United States Department of State wishes Namibia a happy Independence Day. Today is the anniversary, 34 years since Southwest Africa became Namibia on March 21st of 1990. United States values enduring partnership and friendship between our people rooted in our mutual commitment to democratic principles, human rights, and good governance. Where have I heard this before? Together we are working to build a stronger, healthier, more prosperous future for the Namibian people. On your 34th anniversary, we affirm our commitment to your partner honoring President King Yab's legacy and vision for Namibia and Namibians. Well, there you go. From the State Department, wink and blink and not. Well, Botswana officials are not chaffed. They're not chuffed. They are angry. Botswana officials are telling London that we are going to send 10,000 elephants to Hyde Park. See how you like living with elephants. I have an alternative version of this story. How about Botswana stop encroaching on the domain of elephants and their ecosphere? Stop moving further into the places where elephants inhabit and then they won't terrorize you. Now, I'm going to get a backlash for that, but I'm saying it a bit tongue-in-cheek. Furious Botswana officials threaten to send 10,000 elephants to London's Hyde Park so the Brits can try living with them. <laughs> this is all because of the ban on hunting. Furious officials from Botswana have threatened to send 10,000 wild elephants to London's Hyde Park. The dramatic suggestion was made by the African nation's wildlife minister as he condemned a proposed ban on UK safari hunters importing keepsakes, such as tusks from animals they shoot. Politicians and diplomats from Botswana, along with five other Southern African nations, are in the UK to fight against the hunting trophies prohibition bill due for second reading in the House of Commons tomorrow. They say the trophy import ban will drive up safari hunt revenue, hampering wildlife conservation, anti-poaching efforts to save elephants, and impoverishing African villagers who get meat, money, and jobs from tourism. Yeah, so there you go. There's Hyde Park <laughs> in London, where they suggest, I want the Britons to have a taste of living alongside elephants, which are overwhelming my country. In some areas, there are more of these beasts than people. Well, yeah, 
because the Guni speaking peoples, the Bantu pushed you into the Kalahari. That's why. Blame it on the ANC. Blame it on the Nguni speaking peoples who pushed your people into the bush and encroaching on the elephant's terrain. <laughs> well, G7 sanctions will harm Botswana's diamond industry, according to officials. Mm -hmm. The Group of Seven import restrictions targeting Russian diamonds will have a detrimental impact on Botswana's diamond trade and may reverse gains the country has made in recent years. Ladies and gentlemen, Botswana has gone backwards ever since Eric Masisi. Mokwetsi Eric Masisi became president of Botswana. Botswana has gone backwards. Oh my goodness, another 10. Oh, that's Jan Fion. Thank you for being a member for 10 months, Jan. Yep. So the proposal will create a single node location through which all diamonds would pass to verify G7 compliance uh, to avoid Russian diamonds. Well, it's not going to work so well. Russia has donated fertilizer and grain to Hungary, Zimbabwe. The Russian Federation, our all-weather friend. Yeah, look at that, our all-weather friend. Um, we have provided billions of dollars in food aid to Zimbabwe since it abrogated the rule of law and stole property from Zimbabweans in 2000. And do we get a sign like that? No. Stop giving them money. Stop giving them food. Russia donated 25,000 tons of grain and 23,000 tons of fertilizer to Zimbabwe to help combat the effects of El Nino. President Emerson Monagagua accepted the donation Wednesday, saying it would help alleviate the drought Zimbabwe is coping with and the targeted sanctions, which the government has long blamed for the country's economic doldrums. Now, the economic doldrums are a consequence of a thieving kleptocratic party that is oppressive. That's why your situation is bad. Well, Zimbabwe has had protectionist policies preventing the importation of food. That's right. And now they're going to lift them because they have no choice. Zimbabwe's protectionist policies bringing back import duty on imported basic commodities may promote smuggling. Hmm. From July, Zimbabwe will allow duty-free imports of maize, rice, and cooking oil to fill the gap left by crops ravaged by El Nino, reversing a policy from 30 January that introduced levies on imports. Rice and potato seeds are also now exempt from import duties, but other essential products, including sugar, milk, flour, soap, salt, toothpaste, and petroleum jelly are still getting hit with protectionist tariffs that harm Zimbabweans. The World Health Organization is supporting Mauritius in an outbreak of dengue fever. My goodness. Dengue fever is having a moment. According to World Health Organization data, cases increased significantly in 2023 following a small decline in the previous three years. Whilst it has experienced small, highly localized instances of infections in the past, Mauritius has never encountered a dengue outbreak of the scale. Between December 11th of last year and March 19th, authorities recorded 3,311 cases, wow, while Rodriguez Island detected 12,363 cases during the same period. Dengue fever, bad mojo, folks. More disease breaking out in the developing world. <clears throat> Well, Tanzania makes a historic first building, constructing three aircraft. Hmm. Well, Tanzania's aviation sector achieved a key milestone with a recent assembly of three airplanes. These aircraft have been built at the Morogoro Regional Airport. The plant assembled Tanzania's first ever aircraft back in October. The director of the Morogoro plant, engineer Igor Stradl, noted that Tanzania's security, stability, and peace made it the perfect location for the company's expansion. Hmm. Well, the aircraft are assembled by the Air Airplane Africa Limited facility built in 2021 by a Czech company. The Skyleer 600s, as the aircraft is known, unveiling took place at the Diamond Jubilee Hall in Tanzania. Well, there you go. And a gift of membership from Jan Fillion. Thank you for that, Jan. Well, African democracy is a ship in troubled waters, according to the African Union. Duh, wake up to reality. It's about time they started paying attention to this. And light rain got the membership from Jan. Thank you for that. Well, look at this. Coup d'etat, or a clear indication that social contracts have failed. Well, that African governance has failed. Africa, African solutions for African problems. Remember that trite phrase bandied about by American diplomats and military for a full decade while I was in Africa? African solutions, African problems. Well, African solutions are coup d'etat, rampant infectious disease, corruption, theft, and wholesale collapse of economic development. Speaking of Africans, African countries have congratulated their friend, the authoritarian stooge Vladimir Putin, yeah, for his 89% victory election. Several African presidents said they're ready to work with him after the landslide. Putin joins Paul Kagame, who got 99%, and Teodoro Obang, who got 99% in their voter support club. <laughs> yep, lots of congratulations came in. Zimbabwe Electoral Commission dispatched a delegation to the Russian elections led by the organization's chairperson. They said the elections in Russia were free and fair. 
their spokesperson said it's a clear sign of mature democracy in which elections are not perceived as a life and death activity. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Felix Chichikadi of the DRC called the election an eloquent testimony to the confidence of the Russian people in you. Vladimir Putin. The Congo's Denise Sasu Ngueso said Putin's election showed the Russians were behind him as a wartime leader. Libyan Presidential Council Chair Mohamed al Manifi said that Putin had a significant role to play in regional and international relations for the sake of Russia. <laughs> Mali weighed in with a message highlighting support and friendship with Moscow. Lots of rogue African states supporting the rogue Russian. Well, Niger's decision to evict the United States from the West African Sahelian country, a new wrinkle appears, as apparently U.S. officials accused Niger of selling uranium to Iran. Senior U.S. officials raised alarm with a junta over a deal that would give Iran access. And then suddenly, we were no longer welcome there. Niger's decision to end its counterterrorism alliance with Washington came after senior U.S. officials accused the country's ruling a junta of secretly exploring a deal to allow Iran access to its uranium reserves. The decision to end military cooperation with the U.S. was announced Saturday by a spokesman from the junta. So, the United States senior official Molly McPhee and AFRICOM officials went to Niger and accused the military junta, of selling uranium to Iran. Now, does anybody think confronting them was a bad idea? Could there not have been a better way to do this diplomatically? Apparently not in Joe Biden's reckless foreign policy. And that's why we're losing our access to Niger and the Sahel. Well, capsized boat of dozens of Rohingya fleeing from Myanmar is rescued off of Indonesia. Dozens of Rohingya were rescued Tuesday after spending the night on an overturned hull of a capsized boat off the Indonesian coast. According to media reports, as the international charity expressed alarm about the numbers of unaccompanied Rohingya minors making the perilous journey. They are part of Myanmar's persecuted Muslim minority and were part of increasing numbers fleeing. Look at this, that's the boat they were just hanging around on. Wow. 18 miles off the West Aceh coast. Well, a strong earthquake hit Tokyo today. An earthquake measuring a preliminary magnitude of 5.3 hit areas near Tokyo, but no tsunami warning was issued and there were no immediate reports of casualties. The quake struck at 9.08 a.m. with a focus in southern Ibaraki Prefecture in eastern Japan with a depth of around 46 kilometers. It registered lower five on the Japanese seismic intensity scale of seven in Tochichi and Saitama Prefectures. Quake temporarily halted Hokuriku and Josetsu Shinkansen bullet train services connecting Tokyo and the central Japan cities of Nagano and Niigata. So, another earthquake on the Ring of Fire. The Ring of Fire. Go down, down, down. <laughs> New Zealand. The leftist paradise of Mr. Ed, known as Jacinda Ardern, who was the coward and left government because she was going to lose slips into recession for the second time in 18 months. Political parties blame each other for the economic slump that follows aggressive interest rate hikes to tame inflation. New Zealand has slipped into its second recession in less than 18 months. According to government figures, New Zealand's gross domestic product shrank by 0.1% October-December, following a 0.3% decline in the third quarter, which makes it a recession, except to Joe Biden's Washington clowns. Recession comes as Reserve Bank of New Zealand has aggressively raised interest rates to tame some of the highest inflation in the developed world. The downturn also comes despite record inward migration that saw more than 133,000 net arrivals over the past year. People are flooding into New Zealand where there's no space for them, especially from China. Erica's membership. 32 months. Wow, thank you for that. And platoon leader level two. Thank you so much for that, Erica. So, folks, Australia and United Kingdom has signed a mutual defense and security treaty to meet contemporary challenges. Australia and UK signed a new defense and security cooperation agreement with the defense ministers of both countries saying it was required to meet contemporary challenges to maintain a global rules-based order. The treaty was signed by Australian Defense Minister Richard Marles and his UK counterpart Grant Shapps following annual bilateral ministerial talks at Parliament House in Canberra. Australia's relationship with the UK is dynamic and enduring, Marles said, from the UK's leadership in support of Ukraine in efforts to address the Houthi threat to increasing contributions in the Pacific and Indo-Pacific. We continue to work closely together to support a global rules-based order. So a new defense agreement between two longtime partners. Well, Australia defends its former prime minister and current ambassador to Washington after Donald Trump dismisses him. <laughs> 
Australian government backed its ambassador to Washington, the former Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, after U.S. presidential contender Donald Trump called the Keep Up Max a little bit nasty in an interview with Nigel Farage. If he's at all hostile, he will not be there long, Trump said. Rudd, a former China scholar and was chief executive of the U.S. think tank, the Asia Society, before becoming ambassador, previously criticized Trump on China policy, among their issues. Well, that's because Kevin Rudd is an apologist for the communist, and he's wrong. He's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong. Simple as that. Well, Australia will get its most senior visit from Chinese leadership in, since 2017 as relations thaw. Australia received its most senior Chinese leadership visit in nearly seven years with stability a key theme. China's Wang Yi met with his Australian counterpart, Penny Wong. Chang, Wang Yi met with Penny Wong in Australia on his tour of Australia and New Zealand. It was the highest level meeting in Australia between the nations since 2017. It comes as relations continue to thaw after tumultuous period. <laughs> Penny Wong. Well, Canada will halt arms shipments to Israel, the only functioning multi-party democratic state in the Middle East, Israel, which was savagely attacked in an invasion from the elected government of Gaza on October 7th of 2023. And Canada will deny Israel the right to self-defense. Parliamentary motion from new Democratic Party passed with supportive liberals, Bloc Québécois, and the Green Party. Canada will halt future arms sales Israel following a non-binding vote in the House of Commons, the Foreign Minister Melanie Jolie told the Toronto Star. It is a real thing. The decision follows parliamentary motion. The motion passed 204 to 117 in support of liberals with the support of liberals. Yep. Now, here's the thing about this. Here's the thing about this. Canada has promised more than $1.5 in military aid to Ukraine. So they will not support a democratic state, but they will support the second most corrupt country in all of Europe after Montenegro, Ukraine, led by a penis playing piano player, Vladimir Zelensky, a grifter who has taken hundreds of billions of dollars and simply destroyed his country and cost the lives of tens of thousands of Ukrainians. They will give him money. Now this report, of course, is from last year. 1.5 billion to Ukraine but they will not give arms to Israel, a country that was invaded. But Ukraine was invaded. So was Israel. And now more current news. This one is from this week. Canada to give more than 40 million to help buy artillery shells for Ukraine. Yep, 800,000 artillery shells to fuel a war in Ukraine. They'll support Ukraine, but not. Thank you for that super chat, Nick. Any truth, the U.S. having two bases in Australia, we're not even Australia can enter. Um, the U.S. and Australia have a joint um, um, Five Eyes uh, operation in Australia, which Australians are part of. So, uh, more recently, Australia licensed um, and allowed Americans, Marines, to have base in the northern part of Australia. I'm unaware that Australians are not able to enter that. It would be news to me. I would be shocked that they would give us a status force agreement which would deny them access to the base. I mean, you know, um, even in our most secret of, of, of um, intelligence collection facilities in Germany at the height of the Cold War, the Germans could come on the base. They just couldn't enter facilities. Um, so I, I don't think that's true. I think someone's running their mouth, doesn't know what they're talking about. We have a facility in Northern Australia, which I don't know the current status of, but the Obama administration negotiated that and Marines rotate through there, about 1,500 Marines. Uh, I don't even know if it's a permanent base, but that's in Northern Australia and that's a deal with the threat from China among other things. In addition to that, we've had a long-standing Five Eyes um, installation in Australia, which is critical to global security, which the Australians are part of. So I'm not sure what that story is coming from. Well, the tide is turning against Myanmar's military junta, so claims the United Nations. But the thing is, is that we've been talking about this tide turning for months now. Myanmar's ruling junta is losing its war against coalition domestic forces, but still remains highly dangerous, according to UN Special Rapporteur on the human rights situation. The tide is turning because of widespread citizen opposition to the junta and mounting battlefield victories by resistance forces, said Tom Andrews, who presented his latest report to the United Nations Human Rights Council Tuesday this week. But that's been going on for months. Simon Harris is the frontrunner to be Ireland's new prime minister. One day from Leo Varadkar's bizarre resignation, it looks like Simon Harris could get a clear run to be Ireland's next leader. 
37 year old is currently minister for further and higher education. Three other ministers who were viewed as potential competitors have ruled themselves out. Helen McEntee, Heather Humphreys, and Pascal Donahue have confirmed they will not contend for the leadership role. Wow, there you go. Nominations open at 10 a.m. this morning, and they closed at 1 o'clock on Monday for the new prime minister. United States rescues Americans from gang torn Haiti. At least 30 Americans are airlifted daily as political transition plan in Haiti faces delays, but a thousand Americans are trapped there. U.S. on Wednesday facilitated the safe departure of American citizens from Haiti's capital, transporting more than a dozen people by helicopter to the Dominican Republic as civil unrest escalates. On Sunday, U.S. facilitated the first departure of Americans flying more than 30 from Cape Haitian in Haiti's north to Miami's International Airport. Do not travel to Haiti, says the U.S. government. Well, duh. Thank you for that. The United States submits a draft resolution calling for an immediate ceasefire and the sucker and protection of the Hamas terrorist group. According to Winken, Blake, and Nod, that would bring immediate relief to so many people who are suffering in Gaza, the children, the women, the men. And it will bring death, misery, destruction, gang rape, and the dismemberment of Israeli citizens when Hamas resumes its war and its invasion of Israel as a consequence of time to refit, rearm, retrain, and resupply. The United States has foolishly submitted a draft resolution to the United Nations Security Council calling for an immediate ceasefire in Gaza in return for release of hostages. The Gazans, Tomas terrorists, have proven they are unwilling to return the hostages whom they kidnapped and deprived of their liberty and freedom and have abused since October 7th of 2023. We're now talking about November 7th, December, January, February, March, five, nearly six months of their lives stolen by vile, repulsive terrorists. And the United States is backing this. Congress unveils its latest abomination with another trillion dollars of spending. Wow. The leads for the House and Senate Appropriations Committee dropped the latest massive funding package in the current spending cycle, teeing up another spending fight. And Erica has given a 70 Ranch super chat. I haven't seen it come up yet. I don't want to miss it. Thank you for that super chat, Erica. The $1.2 trillion package, something on the order of three two or four times the size of South Africa's entire economy, and it's just one spending package in a $7 trillion budget. It includes funding for six different agencies, the Pentagon, the Homeland Security, State and Foreign Operations, Legislative Branch and Services, Financial Services, Labor. 70% of Congress's obligated funding responsibilities. But Mike Johnson, the Speaker of the House, calls it a win for conservatives. I don't know what he's talking about. They'll increase 42,000 beds for Immigration and Customs Enforcement. 42,000 beds which means that 42,000 criminal alien invaders will now be housed in the country rather than deported. That's not a win for America, Mike Johnson. That's not a win. That's not a win at all. So this is what comes out of this. $27 billion increase for the Defense Department, a 5.2% pay rise for the military, a $1.2 billion to staunch the flow of fentanyl, $3.3 billion for funding for Israel. Six, that's the same as, it's already been there, it's not new, it's the same funding. Slashing 6% overall foreign aid and eliminating funding for United Nations Relief and Works Agency. $20 billion from the IRS and $6 billion on unused COVID funds will be taken back. Halting Consumer Product Safety Commission from banning gas stoves, maintaining the Hyde Amendment, allowing the American flag and other official flags to fly over U.S. diplomatic facilities. Why would we need uh, legislation to say American flags can fly over to, to Memphis? Of course they can't. This is just crazy. Government out of control. Well, Donald Trump is in line for a potential $3.5 billion windfall. They're talking about taking Truth Social, the also-ran social media site, public. And the price has been driven up by the holding company that owns it. Now, this Wall Street Journal article is not news by Amrith Ramakumar. It's propaganda, which denigrates the, the site. Now, I said now Saran because that's true, but this article is full of nonsense attacking this idea. Donald Trump supporters are pushing hard to hand him nearly $3.5 billion windfall by, windfall by driving up the value of his also-ran social media platform, which is getting on the cusp of getting approval to list it on the stock market. Trump's winning lottery ticket could come from social media, which was launched in 2021. Uh, the rest of the article reads very poorly for Trump, and I'm not going to get into it. Well, a man arrested in North Carolina, another criminal alien invader on the terror watch list. Awet Hagos came to the U.S. through Haiti before moving to North Carolina. An illegal criminal alien invader who was taken into custody following a barricade shooting incident in North Carolina was allegedly found to be on a terror watch list and had been living in the area for six months. 
According to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, 32-year-old Awat Hagos is a citizen of Eritrea. Immigration officer said he entered the U.S. illegally after residing in Haiti and been living in North Carolina for six months. After running his fingerprints, authorities allegedly found he was on the terror watch list. So we have terrorists living in our midst because of Joe Biden's feckless domestic policy. Speaking of feckless domestic policy, Joe Biden mandating the elimination of the internal combustion engine. This scumbag must leave the White House. President Joe Biden has announced the strictest regulation of vehicle exhaust emissions ever introduced in the U.S. in a bid to accelerate the auto industry's shift to electric cars, the environmentally destructive electric vehicles. Includes a target of 56% of all U.S. vehicles sold by 2032 must be electric. This is a disaster for the environment. This is a disaster for the United States economy. And what it will result in is the endless trade of polluting old vehicles that will be just like Cuba, will be forced to keep our old cars on the marketplace with internal combustion engines into perpetuity instead of developing new, cleaner, more efficient internal combustion engine cars and forcing only the wealthy to have cars who can afford their $60,000 EVs while collapsing our electric grid and polluting our environment by digging up rare earth elements all over the planet and destroying our natural environment for this fantasy of these leftist hate wankers. Well, an army general pressured an assessment panel to promote a subordinate. There he is, General Charles Hamilton, Commanding General of the U.S. Army Materiel Command, speaks with cadets at Stars and Stripes Youth Mentoring Session in Baltimore. One of the Army's top generals may have abused his authority and subverted the services process for selecting senior leadership in what some officials have described as a conspiracy to prop up a subordinate who was deemed unfit for command. A military.com investigation found that General Charles Hamilton, overseas Army Materiel Command, spent a month last year trying to pull strings behind the scenes for a female lieutenant colonel to breeze through the services battalion. Italian Commander Assessment Program. This included directly lobbying at least three other generals on the assessment panel and successfully pushing officials to let the lieutenant colonel get a second board two days after she failed the first. The interference became so egregious that the director of the Army Command Assessment Program, Colonel Robert O'Brien, penned a memo chronicling Hamilton's conduct on November 1st, immediately after the lieutenant colonel was deemed unfit twice in two assessment panels within 48 hours. Oh, gee. Any personal relationship with her? Is it racial affinity? Is it that they work together? Why is he doing this? Why is he influencing? And this is not unheard of. This happens, folks. Well, Trump can appeal the decision over the Fannie Willis judgment, according to Scott McAfee, the judge in this bizarre case. Yep. Fulton County Superior Court judge overseeing the 2020 bogus election case involving former President Trump will allow the former president and a group of his co-defendants to appeal his decision, allowing District Attorney Fannie Wills to continue. Superior Court Judge McAfee's decision granting the request from Trump and eight of his allies gave them the green light to seek the Georgia Court of Appeals review of his ruling. Why does he, why does he get any say? Why does Judge Scott McAfee, who violated the law despite an air of mendacity over this trial, why did he allow Fannie Willis to remain on it illegitimately? She should have been disbarred, not just removed from the case. And he gets to decide whether Trump gets to appeal his decision. That's nonsense. The appeals court is the one that gets to say that, not him. Well, this is what happens when you tolerate lawlessness, folks. Lawlessness in America. And what am I talking about? This theft that's been going on. New York's $4.4 billion shoplifting shadow economy has been revealed, fueled by eBay and Facebook Marketplace, of course. People stealing things in stores across New York State and then selling them on the street or through eBay and Facebook. Facebook Marketplace. Shoplifting in New York alone rose 64% from June of 2019 to June of 2023. In 2022, the total estimated loss to shops in the state was $4.4 billion, according to the governor. Here you can see goods um, that wind up in the shadow economy being stolen. Notice how they're only putting white folks in the criminal pictures here, but it's not white folks. Yeah, uh, look at that. <clears throat> Middlemen in the shadow economy buy stolen goods for pennies on the dollar and then fence them in person or online marketplaces. Yep. So people are stealing things and then returning them and getting credit for returning something they stole. Even stealing haagen ice cream. Look at that. Look at that bag full of haagen ice cream being stolen. This guy putting stuff in his pocket. This guy. Huh. <laughs> Look at all that stolen goods. A back room illegal pawn shop in New York busted by Suffolk County DA. Stuff stolen goods including kitchen goods, luxury items, even professional building supplies. Going to be sold online. 
And here are the people they arrested. Carlos Uloa, the owner-operator of Easy Pawn, pled guilty to criminal charges of money laundering and criminal possession of a weapon and was sentenced six, five to 16 years. Henry Delgado pled guilty to attempted enterprise corruption. They're seeking six-month sentence. Sandra Hines, manager of Easy Pawn, pled guilty to attempted enterprise corruption. And Sandra Cruz, manager of the warehouse where stolen goods were stored, pled guilty to attempted enterprise corruption. Look who's doing all this. Yep. Yep, 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 yep. Well, Joe Biden has canceled more student debt and this he can get away with because of a Bush era program which forgives the student debt of those in public service at the federal, state, and county level. Yep. President Biden said Thursday he's canceling student debt for 78,000 teachers, firefighters, and other public service workers under existing law. That forgives $6 billion under the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Program and is the president's latest attempt to violate the law and wipe out college debt. So here's the deal. Another election year pandering and 78,000 people who borrowed money from us, the taxpayer, not from private banks, will now have that debt forgiven and we bear the burden of that debt. We must pay back the debt for their education. That is wrong. Morally bankrupt. California has promised to spend a quarter of a trillion dollars that it does not have, folks. It does not have a quarter trillion dollars. Annual financial report from the state controller's office released March 15 details more than $255 billion in unfunded liabilities the largest in the U.S. After a year past its due date, the annual financial report from the California State Comptroller's, or Controller's Office released details of $255 billion in unfunded liabilities. It's a record for the state, the highest amount in the nation, of course, because California's the largest state. Pension debt and other employee-related benefits, more than $150 billion, or 60% of the liabilities. $64 billion is related to outstanding bond debt from past projects, including schools, capital assets. Yep, so there you go. Wow, money that does not exist. United States intelligence community is pairing up with tech companies to look for foreign interference in our elections coming up this year. Yep, that's right, folks. Take a look at this. So, U.S. intelligence community is ramping up work with technology companies ahead of the November elections, and that is Skeptic. Thank you for your membership. Thank you, Nick. U.S. intelligence agencies are turning cybersecurity companies like never before. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And as we said, Marcus Houston has died. Wow, that is shocking. Let's see if anything else turns up on that now. Matthew Dixon. Thank you. Yep, Financial Times reporting now 25 minutes ago. Yeah, SA, oh, the SA People says he committed suicide. Susan Custer. Times Live says alleged suicide. Reportedly shot himself, says the IOL. Wow, well, let's get to those stories now. We've got it after we get all these memberships. Raymax. Yep. Um, I think that's it. One or two more. Wow. So this is, oh, come on. That's Pip Jacobs. Marcus used to commit suicide, according to this report. Alleged suicide. Wow. And shoot himself, says these guys. Wow. Let's get to this story here, folks. All right. I think we got everybody in that. 165 Rand on the Daily Lotto. I'm spending it all. <laughs> Thank you for that, Nick. People forget Hunga Tonga Ocean Volcano. What are you talking about, Tony Nash? All right, let's get to this, folks. Uh, still 109 people here. Thank you for being on the program. Appreciate you being here. Marcus Eusta commits suicide. Disgraced former Steinhoff International CEO Marcus Eusta reportedly committed suicide during an arrest. Wow. Newsroom Africa reported that sources close to Steinhoff investigates confirmed that he shot himself. According to MoneyWeb, the penalty is payable that he has to pay on April 19th. It includes a contribution of $10 million to reimburse them for reasonable costs incurred in connection. Wow. He was born in Pretoria and attended Afis. He also attended UCT in Stellenbosch. He's married to Ingrid Houston and has three children. Breaking story, more to follow. That's from SA People News. Times Live says he committed suicide, allegedly. Disgraced former Steinhoff CEO Marcus Eusta has died allegedly from suicide. While Western Cape Police were yet to confirm his death, sources close to Eusta alleged he shot himself today. According to Newsroom Africa, he is alleged to have taken his own life during negotiations with police over his imminent arrest. Wow. Wow. The extent of the dishonesty and manipulation of the financial results of Steinhoff between 2014 and 2017 and how its financial position was reported meant that publications did not fairly represent its financial position. They were false, deceptive, and misleading. They provided false information about the cash balances on hand and false information to assess the prospects of future net cash flows arising from ordinary retail operations. 
Material misstatements that led to existing and potential investors. Okay. Wow. That's crazy. So Marcus used to, um, now it's being reported, apparently he is dead uh, from a self-inflicted gunshot wound, according to the IOL. Details are not being released this time. Huh. He filed an appeal against the fine, but he still got hit with the fine. Born in Cape Town in 61, he rose to the ranks of the business world with a combination of sharp intelligence, undeniable charisma, and ambitious vision for the future. His early career was marked by significant achievements in the South African corporate sector, leading him to the pinnacle of his profession as the CEO of Steinhoff, a global retail conglomerate with operations across Europe, Africa, and Australasia. An avid horse breeder in 2016, he was reported to be one of Africa's richest people worth $400 million. Under used his leadership, Steinhoff experienced unprecedented growth, expanding his footprint through aggressive acquisitions and diversification strategies. Hmm. But things took a turn in 2017. So if he was worth $400 million, why couldn't he just pay a 475 million rand fine? Hmm. In one week, $160 billion of Steinhoff's value were wiped off the markets back then. I remember that. The scandal is often compared to the Enron debacle and its scope and impact highlights significant flaws in corporate governance and financial oversight. The years following his departure from Steinhoff were marred by legal battles, public scrutiny, and the unraveling of his once unassailable reputation. Accused of orchestrating a complex fraud that inflated profits and asset values, he became a central figure in discussions about corporate ethics. The Independent Line reached out to the Police Service and Director of Priority Crime Investigation for comment. It's a developing story, Mark. It's used to dead. Wow. Wow. Crazy. Isn't it time for Wednesdays with that woke politician? No, it's not. Um, that's not happening. Uh, Ronaldo wrote to me earlier, and that's been delayed until... Until, come on, why am I not live here? Okay, that's been delayed until tomorrow. Wednesday will be on Friday now. Sorry about that. Yep, yep, so there you go. Yeah, we're a little bit over in case you're wondering. Okay, those that have served, it's rare to meet a full colonel that salutes you first. Not rare, impossible. Yeah, it is rare, isn't it? That's why I do it. It's a sign of respect. Yep, 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 yep. What do people got to say here now? So, um, Lieutenant Colonel Scheller from Marines was fine pension revoked for speaking up about Afghan. I should hope Trump rectifies this. Um, well, the problem with that is what he did was inappropriate and it's illegal under the Uniform Code of Military Justice. You can't do that. You can't do what he did. So that's not going to be changed. If it is changed, it's not fair to those who follow the rule of law. So I understand what you're saying, Nick, but um, he's not allowed to do that. Not allowed to do that. You can't speak against the chain of command like that. I'm so hot full of the word apartheid. New laws being passed by the brain dead A and C with no positive outcomes for any run of the mill citizens. South Africa's tumbling into an abyss. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. It's already at the abyss, folks. It's at the abyss. Uh, my super sticker is come and gone by now, but thanks for keeping your eyes open. Yeah, I didn't see it appear on the screen. Uh, did it come up, Eric? And I missed it. That's why I did the ring of the bell. Thank you for that. Climate hoax designed to destroy freedom, says Tony Nage. The Lady Pondor is squealing about Israel and contravention ICJ, but silent about her best friend, Hamas terrorist. Exactly. Yep, absolutely silent about him. Uh, I think the IDF were hoping to come to an agreement with hostages and ceasefire during Ramadan. Well, that may have been their hope, but it didn't happen. Secret CIA base. I see more and more about that. Where is the secret CIA base? Uh, it seems like Check the News just came out now. Hmm? Game over. Court victory for Zuma and K party, but ANSI threatens. Oh, so let me do that. Is there a news break on that? No, it's from two, nothing today. Nothing today. Nothing today. All right. <clears throat> Where are we at here? Where are we at? Lost track of things. Okay. Mondre says, Cyril plans to use Putin's strategy and borrow Biden's voting machines. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Dropped a glass. That sucks. All right, cool. I think we've caught up now with the chat. A little bit behind. Tumbling to the abyss. You're hanging by fingernails. Exactly. No, I was reading someone's comment. That's not my comment. I said you're already in the abyss. Yep. Three months sober. Come on, man. You know that. <laughs> Mandela's best friends, Arafat, Gaddafi, Castro. Everybody knows that. exactly, Jonathan. That's exactly right. That's who his friends were. Yep. Yep. And they blame us for not allying with them. Well, we were dealing with the Soviet Union trying to expand communism. And that's the reality of what was going on then. 
people need to understand that and accept that for what it is. Yep. Anyway, wow, this uh, stream for some reason, maybe because South Africa's land theft hit very hard at the beginning. He had 155 there. We were over 140 for, my goodness, 12, 10, and 12. For half an hour, we were over 140. Yeah, over half an hour. That was awesome. Thanks for all those people tuning in. $100 attended his inauguration. Hmm. But let me go back to that story again. We're going to talk about that land expropriation since that's what the theme of this thing was when we started. That was the big story we're talking about. So the National Council of Provinces in South Africa, seven provinces, six have approved the expropriation of land without compensation. So the National Council of Provinces, or eight provinces, excuse me, four and the Western Cape against the other nine provinces. I misspoke. I said seven, six to nine, but eight. Yep. Um, the legislation must return to the National Assembly for changes means a 16-year-old legislative journey is unlikely to be completed before the May elections. Time is against the National Assembly to properly assess the largely technical changes to National Council of Provinces made to the expropriation bill and then to bring legislation for a vote. Only five working days remain on the parliamentary calendar before the House rises on April, March 28th, ahead of the elections. If it runs out of time, the option of reconvening the National Assembly remains, even if MPs are on the elections campaign trail, particularly if a fully virtual sitting had to be called. Once the House approves, the expropriation bill goes straight to the presidential in-tray. But politically, it's an awkward pickle. If the National Assembly fails to finalize the bill, it lapses come the 29 May elections. It would be up to the post-poll incoming MPs to revive the legislation and finalize it. The DA will continue to fight this archaic bill to the very end in order to protect the property rights of South Africans. The DA will not allow them to pass the dangerous legislation for bad faith electioneering. Well, good luck with that. You only have 83 members of Parliament. It's a 16-year journey to get here. The governing party's efforts on the expropriation legislation started and failed for the first time in 2008 when the draft law, which ditched the willing seller, willing buyer principle, was withdrawn on the back of ANC conference resolutions in Polokwane. Parliament's legal advisors indicated that banning recourse to the courts would be unconstitutional instead of amending the bill. It was withdrawn. It took until March 2015 for a revised bill to come to Parliament. It was passed in 2016, but was returned to Parliament by Jacob Zuma in February 2017 because of concerns over public participation. Then the new version came about, and it just keeps coming and coming. The problem with this is that it's immoral, and it has no place in a legitimate society, and it will undermine foreign direct investment and foreign ownership of anything to invest in South Africa. Why would I put my money in South Africa when the state will expropriate it because I've said something about them? Not going to happen. Oh, excuse me. Oh. Excuse me. How's your campaign going? Uh, I don't know, Garrett. I guess it's going okay. Mark is used to die at home in Hermans today before he shot himself in Hermans. Patrick Brian Pereira. Dude, we covered that. Thank you for tuning in. Covered that uh, when the story broke because one of our viewers caught that on News 24. They were the first to report it. So I said it's it's been reported by a single source. Now it's been reported by multiple sources. Apparently he shot himself when the police came to arrest him. I'm not sure what they came to arrest him for. I mean... He's got a judgment. I mean, what's the arrest for? Why did they come arrest him? Did they have something new on him? Hmm. Tim Brawl to Seth used to be our DA counselor, says Charles. I don't know who that is. Don't know who that is. All right. The current version of the expropriation legislation introduced in Parliament in October 2020, allowing for no compensation in expropriation of, among other things, state land, abandoned land, or land held speculation. But again, this is property. It's not land. So stop playing this little game because they're going to use it to take your jewels, your stocks, your pension, your bucky, your everything you own, not just land. The bill was adopted in the National Assembly on September 28th with objections by the DA, the EFF, the IFP, the Freedom Front Plus, and ACDP. Then the NCOP began its processes. That was done by December 2023, but the NCOP Committee on Transport, Public Service, Administration, Public Works, and Infrastructure decided to delay the finalizing of provincial mandates to, until February of 2024. It took longer, two weeks later than initially scheduled, for the council provinces to vote on Tuesday. It's up to the National Assembly to modify the bill next, and that isn't going to happen before an election. So that ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. Ain't going to happen. Yep. Anyway, um, there you have it, folks. All right. Well, um, where are we at here? Hour and 43. Wow. Not alone in the universe. <laughs> Patrick, no, you're not alone in the universe. See, I did receive a letter from the Veterans Administration, um, the Veterans Administration detailing the, my veterans benefits. I'm not going to read you a whole letter, but I will read you a few things here, which are, thank you. This confirmed me a few things. Number one, um, 
that uh, has my claim number that says, you are the veteran. Well, yes, I am, as opposed to a surviving spouse. I'm the veteran. Military information, character and discharge of service dates. Um, Army honorable from 1983 to 1987, April 28th. And then Army honorable the next day from 1987 until September of 2019. So every single day from November 2nd, 1983 until September 30th of 2019. Service-connected disability, yes, the percentage, the amount. And then um, they send a letter with wartime periods, and they include special terms here, but they also thing, tell you about things that will affect your right to getting a disability payment. You can lose your veteran's disability payment despite valid service in defense of the nation. If you return to active duty or you get workers' compensation, your pay gets cut. That makes sense. Um, if you have any change in employment, if you're getting 100% disability, then you can have your, this cut. If you are admitted to hospital, they can suspend your payment because you're getting care at VA expense. And this is the one that really, the only one you have control over. Incarceration benefits will be reduced if you're incarcerated in a federal, state, or local penal institution for more than 60 days following conviction of a felony. Yep, if you don't cooperate with the VA, fail to submit evidence to their request, fail to attend an examination when requested, or submit false and fraudulent evidence. Yep, well, that's fair enough. You shouldn't be lying to the VA. That's, uh, get this every year. Uh, and I get it uh, in March because March is when my initial um, award was determined. So, no, that's not a DD-214. Uh, what you're talking about is a DD-214. There's no dot in there. That's a discharge paper. My DD-214, I wonder if I have it here. I don't know if I have it in here. So let me see. I know I've got it, but I don't think it's on here. That's your discharge paperwork. And your discharge paperwork includes all the different things. Let me see. Um, DD-214. I don't think I have it on here. Oh, doing a search for it real quick. I know where it is at, but I don't think it's on here. Well, there's one, but it's not mine. It's someone else's. <laughs> From genealogy. Yep, still searching. It's taking a long time to search this drive. It's pretty full of documents. So I don't think it's going to find it. I'll let it keep going. 132 likes. That's awesome. A little bit of super chat and 16 new members. That's pretty cool. 10, 5, and 1. We had three times they joined. No, the DD-414 is for all service members. It's not for the Navy. It's your discharge paperwork. It has all of your service on it. It has your awards and decorations. It has a miscellaneous information on it, too, for about benefits and things like that. So, um, no, nothing there. So let me try it this way. There we go. I got it. Now I had to put a dash in there. So, all right. So... Yep, it has my name, my department component branch, Army, regular Army, military intelligence, rank, colonel, pay grade, 06, date of birth, reserve obligation, I have none, place I entered active duty, home of record, last duty assignment, which was the U.S. Army War College, uh, where I separated, Carlisle Barracks, command which transferred, commands for, I'm transferred, see I'm still in the military, to the U.S. Army Reserve um, Group, retired, yep. And then it has primary specialty, has me down as 48 Juliet, uh, Sub-Saharan African Foreign Area Officer, all source intelligence, uh, counterintelligence, signals intelligence, yep. And then um, it has my dates of service on this period, and it covers this period when I came back in in 1989, and it covers it all the way up. Decorations, Legion of Merit, Defense Meritorious Service Medal, Sixth Award, Meritorious Service Medal, Army Meritorious Second Award, Joint Service Combination Medal, Army Service Army Combination Medal, Eighth Award, Joint Service Achievement Medal, Army Achievement Medal, Fourth Award, Joint Meritorious Unit, and it continues in Block 18 on continuation sheets. My military education, it has um, whether I went through a service academy or scholarship, neither which I got. Um, loan repayment, that's not on there because I didn't get loan repayment. I didn't ask for that. And then I'm subject to active duty recall by the Secretary of the Army. Yep. Received a U.S. Army flag, a U.S. flag, served in designated imminent danger pay area, and it goes through all the periods when I did that, completed um, full first service, Valorous Unit Award, and anyway, it continues on, and there's a continuation sheet for that. And then what else on here? Then it goes on here. There we go. Terrorism Expeditionary Medal, Global War and Terrorism Service Medal, Armed Forces Services Medal, Armed Service, Army Service Ribbon, Overseas Service Ribbon, 10th Award, Kosovo Campaign Medal with Bronze Service Star, NATO Medal, Kuwait Liberation Medal, Saudi Arabia, Kuwait Liberation Medal, Kuwait Air Assault Badge. Yeah, and it goes on and on. So that's the 214, and that's my 214. So, yep. 
DD-214, that's your discharge paperwork. It has all your qualifications. You needed that. It used to be it was a time when you had to have that in order to get a job. You had to have that good job. No silver stars. No, I have no silver star. I have no bronze star. Uh, when I served in the Gulf War, um, I think we hadn't had major combat since Vietnam. And I think a lot of these guys were like, oh, we got to put people in. So every person in my battalion who was a captain and above automatically got put in for a bronze star, including the chaplain. They got bronze stars. To me, that cheapened the value of the, of the decoration. It's not an award, it's a decoration. Uh, you know, the bronze star given to everyone who was a captain above, the exception were the sergeant's major, both of whom also got bronze stars. The only other people who got bronze stars was actually a silver star, and that was the Delta Company commander for his unit engaging in a heroic fight against the Tawakana Republican Guard Division, and he got a silver star. The scout platoon leader didn't get a bronze star because he was a lieutenant, but he got a Army combination with a V device. That's incredibly rare. Rarely do you see a combination medal with a V device for Valor. You see it on bronze stars, but not, and silver stars, but not on combination. It's allowed, but it's very rare. Last time I saw it was was in Vietnam. Uh, Purple Heart, no. Purple Heart is for being wounded in combat. Yep. No medals with blue ribbons. I don't know what that is. Yep. So, yeah, no silver stars. No bronze stars. Uh, Legion of Merit, though, that's a coveted decoration, and I got that on my discharge. Legion of Merit is a, is a relatively small group of people for their achievement. So that's a pretty cool one. I like that one. So anyway, but I don't even have it on my, my uh, medals board because I haven't updated it since I retired. <laughs> Congressional medal. Um, no, I have medals, uh, decorations from foreign governments. Germany and Liberia have decorated me. I have... Um, Decorations from Kuwait and Saudi Arabia. Yeah, but I don't have decorations. Uh, Congressional Medal of Honor. No, that's an extremely rare sort of thing that people get. Very rare. Yep. No, I know you are, Charles. I'm just answering the question as best I can, honestly and faithfully. So, 133 likes. Wow, 134. Someone just hit it. Thank you for hitting that like button. Appreciate that. We're coming up on two hours, and wow, what a, what a day. Uh, celebrities given medals, none of them deserve. Yeah, no, I agree. Greatest honor medal in your opinion? Well, the Congressional Medal of Honor is is the greatest honor can be bestowed upon a service member. Yeah, and hopefully it's almost. I mean, I can't think of cases where it's not deserved. Lots of people deserve Congressional Medal of Honor have never gotten it. Uh, the Purple Heart is because you got wounded. I mean, technically, I could have you know reported an injury I had in combat and got a Purple Heart, but I wasn't shot, so I wasn't going to report that. So I never got a Purple Heart. Um, in England, if it's a word twice, you call it with bar. My old man had something with, uh, it was in Yemen. Uh, no, uh, so our, our decorations are different. Let me, um, oh, I had that before. I don't have it handy now. But we have devices. So for instance, if you get a decoration which can be awarded for valor, you can be awarded something for achievement or for service, but for valor, that's in combat, you get a V. V for valor goes right on the device. Um, you also we also have stars to indicate things, and then we have numbers. So, for instance, my overseas ribbon, which is actually more than ten foreign tours, but I have ten decorations on there, but I can't find a ten to put on there, and I can't put ten stars on there; they don't fit on the ribbon. So, ten foreign tours complete. It's actually twelve, but whatever. Um, so, I have a ten. So that would be the number ten on my. Southwest Asia Service Medal for Desert Shield, Desert Storm, and Desert Calm. I am one of only 18,000 people, roughly, who qualify of the 600, 700,000 American military deployed for that conflict. Only one of one of about 16 or 18,000 people were eligible for all three stars um, because you had to be there for Desert Shield, which I was there, participate in the conflict, Desert Storm, and they're participating in the aftermath, which was Desert Calm. Very few people were involved in all that. Only about sixteen or 18,000 of us actually were authorized to wear all three stars. You see a lot of people wearing three stars just because that's how they came out. People didn't know better. But most people are not authorized three stars. Um, on the National Defense Service Medal, when you serve in a period of conflict, you get that. And for subsequent periods, you get a star. So I've got a star on mine for two different periods of conflict. And then you get, uh, so the first one was the Gulf War, and then the second was post-9-11 uh, conflict era, so I got a star on there. And then um, you get other accoutrements. On my Kuwaiti Liberation Medal from the government of Saudi Arabia, I have a big palm frond on there because that's what they put in their medal. George says I got five medals. Okay, 18,000, a small number considering the amount of those involved. It is, Nick, very few people. I read the story, true story of one Medal of Honor from Namibia, 
U.S. guys drove the motorbike back and forth, saving people many times, never got hit the same road. Hmm, interesting. Don't know that story. Whether younger Americans know Chester Puller. Chesty Puller. Well, Chesty Puller, of course, is a very famous Marine. The Marines know who he is. All Marines know who Chesty Puller is. I mean, that's inculcated in them, drilled in their heads. They all know who he is. And Navy guys know who Admiral Nimitz is. All drilled in their head. Yep. Joe Milley don't deserve his medal, says Hendo. Um, I don't know. Maybe he deserved them when he earned them. Metal board will look great on your set. Uh, yeah, RJ, but again, so look, I'm, I'm, here's the thing. So, you know, it's, it's a little frustrating because people who are envious, who've accomplished very little, they don't like when people talk about their achievements. Look, I'm, 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 I'm a humble person. I joke around about being the best in the group and this, that, and the other, but it's, it's just self-deprecating humor for the most part. I mean, you don't see any of these things behind me, right? There's nothing hanging on the wall, no decorations, no awards, none of that stuff. Um, so... In order to run for a campaign, I got to tell people who I am and what I've accomplished. So on my cards that go out for my campaign, I have to tell people what I've done. So here's a small smattering of the things I've accomplished in my career. A 37-year U.S. Army combat veteran, chief of staff of a $3 billion program with the National Security Agency. Folks, that's um, 57 billion Rand program that I was chief of staff of. 254 million effort to rebuild the post-conflict armed forces of Liberia. And I don't even detail all the things I accomplished, which is several pages in that time. Author of nine presidential daily briefs for the President of the United States. I authored over 1,200 strategic intelligence products at Defense Intelligence Agency. Can you imagine how much research and knowledge it takes to write 1,200 different intelligence products, briefings, analysis reports? It's crazy. 30-year intelligence analyst, judge of elections. Army counterintelligence agent investigated espionage against the U.S., developed HIV and AIDS programs throughout Africa, taught undergraduates at Iowa State University, taught postgrads in national security strategy and policy, macroeconomics, African studies at U.S. Army War College. I'm a published author with books published by Stellenbosch University and the Army War College, which makes me more qualified to be the head of Harvard University than Claudine Gay. She has zero books published as an academic. I have two. <laughs> Um, radio broadcaster, independent journalist, energy industry analyst, dairy farmer in, in rural Appalachia, a polyglot speaking six languages, including French, German, Afrikaans, Swahili, and Setswana. Served in Germany, three tours of duty, Italy, Tunisia, Liberia, Botswana, Malawi, Niger, Mauritania, Uganda, and Ethiopia. Gulf War, Bosnia, Kosovo campaign veteran, and rose from private to sergeant to colonel. And you get people who say that that's boasting. Those are statements of fact. Do you see me hanging up all that stuff behind me? No, I don't. I don't. I don't. Um, the South African equivalent of Victoria Cross is the uh, owner's cruise. Yeah, it's changed. Yeah, it, it has. And that's right. That's I know South Africans who got that under SADF. Patrick says the colonel for senator. Well, that'd be nice. Uh, open to correction. Um, no, you're right, Nick. Uh, I disagree with your view. It's not clout any more than your rank and title. Huh? I don't understand what you're saying there. What are you disagreeing with, RJ? What, what's not clout? Are you saying that accomplishments don't matter? Or or I, I don't understand. Andre says, well done. Well, Andre, that's just a small smattering of the things that I've been able to accomplish in my life. That's why I find it so funny. That's why I find it so funny to see people attack, you know, people of honor, people who have accomplished things. Listen, you have to do what's right, moral, and just all the time. And that's been my guidestone. That's what I've done. And you don't shirk from the tough things. Ah, ha, 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 ha. It's varying degrees of uh, proficiency, John. Yeah, I didn't read the whole statement. Thank you very much. Like Pratnia for Kansni, eh? Anyway, so, you know, it's, look, see, it's right like that right there. So John comes back with that. So, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's, that's why I don't boast. I don't put those things up. There's nothing wrong with it. Look, I've gone to people's homes and their walls are full of photographs and awards and decorations and ribbons and accomplishments, and that's fine. People are welcome to be proud of their accomplishments. I'm not, I'm not embarrassed by my accomplishments. I'm proud of the things that I've been able to accomplish on my own and with others and as a team. But, you know, it's uh, just not something I put up. You know, and, and it's still funny to see people, you know, boast. Oh, like during during the debate and that woman went on there. What did she say? Let's, let me find that because uh, Paulie sent that to me. Let me find that. That was so comical to hear that. Let me see what she said. Come on. Where's that? Paulie. Come on. Paulie. I've written to Paulie in a bit. So, Paulie. Okay. He sent me the screen captures. All right. So, 
Here it is. Let me see if I can get this come up. Yeah. So I hope Wyatt can talk about the issues instead of himself. <laughs> He's such a show off. <laughs> I hadn't even said a word. <laughs> I hadn't even said a word. Uh, yeah. So anyway. Uh, that, of course, was the three-minute introduction at the debate, which was really a question-answer session, not debate. And so for three minutes, we're supposed to tell people who we are and what we're all about. So, I mean, what am I supposed to do? Get up and say, hi, I'm Chris White. I'm running for state legislature representing the 92nd District. Let me spend the next two minutes and 45 seconds telling you all about John Jarvis. John Jarvis is an incredible veteran of the UK Armed Forces who served with distinction around the globe in places like Cyprus and Northern Ireland. He's a true hero and someone we should all pay respect to. So let me tell you more about John uh, as I go through my introduction of myself. <laughs> I'm not picking on you, John. I just threw an example. I could have picked another name out there. I mean, attacking me for talking about myself when I'm supposed to talk about myself. It's just the height of stupidity. People like that all over, you know. A lot of people are just crap, and the more I interact with them, the more I find it. I, I've kind of led a sheltered life in many respects because I spent most of my time in uniform, and um, when you're in uniform, people deal with you a certain way. I don't know if they deal with the dirt bags, but dealing with a lot of dirt bags now. What I miss here? Putting up your earned medals is saying something about who you are that's not boasting. Oh, no, okay, gotcha, RJ. Yeah, no, that's why I asked for clarification because I wasn't clear what you said. No, it's not boasting. Um, it's not. Um, it's just I, it's not something I typically do, you know. Now, when we have veteran ceremonies, like we're going to have one here very shortly for um, Somalia. So we've got three events that I've got to commemorate here for veterans. The first is in three days. That's um, the beginning of the Kosovo campaign in 1999. On the 29th, it's Vietnam Veterans Day, so that's eight days away. And on the 31st, it's the end of Operation Restore Hope in Somalia. So Kosovo, Vietnam, and Somalia all coming up in the next week plus. Uh, on those events, I'll be wearing my white shirt with my rank and my ribbons and my medals and all that stuff on it. But that's because it's in a formal event and I'm allowed to do that as a retiree. So that's not boasting, that's just wearing what I'm supposed to. But even then, I don't even have all my medals. I don't have the Legion of Merit on there yet. I uh, agree with you that somehow rank says something of where you are and who you've been. It's something she don't. Yeah, no, no. Look, I'm a retired colonel, full colonel, and I earned that. I earned that the hard way. I mean, my path to full colonel was not traditional in any sense of the word. And I didn't take a traditional path because I wanted to make a difference. And the difference required me to take a different path. I did many things, not wrong or immoral, but I took career decisions that are not career enhancing but they enhanced my ability to perform my job and what I wanted to do in the Army. And it was a risk, but I made it all the way to full colonel, a rare distinction. In the U.S. Army, there are 18, 18 out of 550,000 soldiers, 18 colonels who did or do what I did. 18. Now, when I came on active duty in 1989, there were 9,700 officers commissioned. And over 5,000 of them, or 4,200 of them, something like that, came on active duty, plus West Point, plus OCS. We had over 5,000, 6, almost 6,000 active duty lieutenants in 1989 at the end of the Cold War. Didn't end until 1990, began to end. But anyway, so they were still taking in large assessments of numbers, accessions of numbers, accessions of numbers coming in to fill a Cold War army. That 6,000 on active duty shrank down to when I got promoted to about 148 officers made colonel, or 148 or 178, something like Let's go 170. I don't remember the exact number. Let's say 175 officers made full colonel from 6,000 who came on active duty in 1989. That's a heck of a winnowing down. And of that 178, maybe three or four became generals. Yep. Yeah, that's a, that's a very much a winnowing down things. So no, it's a hell of an accomplishment. It's a hell of an accomplishment to achieve it. Making Lieutenant Colonel is an accomplishment in the military. Making major these days is, is no small feat either. Um, becoming a, a master sergeant or a sergeant major is pretty impressive too for enlisted folks. Not easy. Not easy. So anyway. Mike, what was a tank commander first class, if I'm not mistaken? Hans Ulrich Rudolph, Stuka pilot. Yeah, no, no, no. I'm not very familiar with Hans uh, Ulrich Rudolph. I've read his biography, his autobiography. There's a pilot, von Hartmann, who had the highest kill count. I don't know who that is. Cool beans. 
Anyway, all right, folks, we are at two hours and I need to wrap up. I got stuff to do. I got to go work on a campaign. So thank you all for being here. Thanks for hitting that like button. Thanks for the super chat. Thanks to um, Nick and to, um, I think it was Jan Fion who, and it was it? Yeah, Nick15 and Jan did one new members. Thank you for that. Um, with the low revenue rate that comes in the channel, those memberships actually do help a little bit. Uh, my mate is a major in Georgetown. Okay, gotcha. Gotcha. No lieutenant colonel position yet. Gotcha. All right, cool. All right, thanks, everybody. Have a lovely day. I've got to shower and then hit the road. I also got to check some data that I was sent because it confused people. So let me get working on that, and then I'll catch you all later. Uh, tomorrow... Um, we'll do Wednesdays with the Colonel. Um, I may have to do my broadcast early. I have to take a look and see because Ronaldo are going to do a broadcast. So, yeah, we'll do it earlier, but um, I'm going to have to skid out because I have another physical therapy appointment tomorrow afternoon. So, anyway, there you have it. Uh, this weekend, I will probably only do one rugby game, and that would be the Stormers game just because I've got to go campaign. I can't do the whole day for rugby. So, thanks, everybody. Have a lovely night. Appreciate you being here. I'm hungry. I need a shower, and I got work to do. Y'all take care. God bless. Cheers. Thank <laughs> you.